Thank you very much. Very happy to be here. <clears throat> and I want to thank Damon Horowitz for, in a way, warming up to what I want to talk about because he asked you questions about what you want to accomplish with your life. And what I'm going to talk about, effective altruism, provides one answer to that question. And I really hope that what I'm going to say will lead <coughs> at least some of you to think about that and perhaps to change some of your thoughts about what you are going to do with your life. And the answer that effective altruism gives is the answer that you have on the screen that you could think about the most good you can do with your life. Not just can you make the world a better place, but how to do the most good, change the world the most that you can in a positive direction. And that's what effective altruism is about. Here's the Wikipedia account. If you want to find out what any unfamiliar thing is, of course, you go to Wikipedia. Ten years ago, you couldn't have gone to Wikipedia to find out about effective altruism because there would have been no entry there. In fact, the term had not really been coined. It's a very recent movement, a social movement now that is mostly people a lot younger than I am, mostly millennials, who have decided to make altruism, living to improve the world, an important part of their life. Not that they've all become saints. <clears throat> we don't expect there to be many saints walking around the world who do nothing but think about making the world a better place. There are a few people like that, and some of them have made a huge difference. <clears throat> but most of us are rather thinking about, well, this is one thing, this is a part of my life. And so that's the philosophy behind this, that you want to make the world a better place, but to do that, you need to apply evidence and reason to find out what is the most effective way to improve the world. And perhaps that's where this topic fits into the theme of this session, what's the point of science? Because as we'll see as we go on, science can help us to work out what is the most effective thing we can do. Science, but not only science. Also, ethics or values is really important here, as I'll show you in a few moments. But let me also begin by showing you some of the people involved in this movement as examples of how <coughs> relatively ordinary people can make a big difference in the world. Firstly, though, I do want to say a little bit more about the values that we're going to talk about. What counts as making the world a better place? So here's a suggestion that comes from somebody who I'll also mention later, Holden Karnofsky, <coughs> who's made an influential contribution to effective altruism. In his view, and this is my condensation of his thoughts here, effective altruists take a universal perspective. That means they are concerned about making the world a better place, not just their local community, not just their own country, but the world as a whole. It may be that they can do more good for the world locally, that's possible, but the standard is, are you doing the most good for the world as a whole? Secondly, what do you mean by doing good here? Well, a simple answer is if you reduce suffering, if you make people happier, make, them, make their lives go better, those are very concrete ways in which you're doing good in the world. So suffering is a bad thing. If you can reduce that, you're doing good. <coughs> Premature death is obviously in itself a cause of suffering, loss of happiness, and itself a bad thing. So if you can reduce the number of children who die before they reach their fifth birthday, for example, a statistic that UNICEF 
the United Nations Children's Fund measures, that's a good thing. But it's not only humans who matter, the suffering of animals matters as well. And in fact, there are more animals, we're inflicting more suffering on animals, perhaps, than humans, just because of the vastly greater number, some 60 billion animals that we raise for food worldwide each year, often in appalling conditions before killing them. So that matters as well, and that's another way of doing good in the world. And the final idea here is the concept of expected value. Sometimes you can do a small amount of good with certainty or near certainty, but there's a different strategy that might do a much larger amount of good, but with less certainty. Expected value says discount the good that you're trying to do by the odds of success. So consider what the odds of success are, consider how good, how big a difference you'll make, discount that and you get an idea of the expected value of your particular project. And we'll look at some examples of that too before I finish. Okay, let's look at some of these effective altruists. Toby Ord is now a research fellow in philosophy at Oxford. A few years ago, when this when movement was just beginning, when he was playing a crucial part in getting this movement uh, to begin, he was a graduate student. He was living on a graduate scholarship, which was something like 14,000 UK pounds per year. Living in an expensive city like Oxford, that's not very much money. But he felt that he was quite comfortable. He felt that he didn't really need more money to live, to live well. So he started thinking about, suppose that he was successful in having an academic career, in becoming, as he is now, a research fellow, or a later an associate professor or a professor. In all of those stages, the amount of money he was earning would increase. But suppose that he lived on the same amount of money that he was living as a graduate student since that was enough for him. What else could he do with the money that he would then have left over? And he looked at some effective things that you can do with contributing to charities. And here's one of them. This is a clinic in North Africa that treats children to prevent them going blind from trachoma. Trachoma is the most common cause of preventable blindness in the world today, and it's relatively cheap to treat. As you see here, there is good data that suggests that you can prevent a case of blindness for somewhere between $25 and $100 per case of blindness prevented. So when Toby Ord added up the amount of money that he would have surplus to what he felt he really needed or could comfortably live on, and divided that by the cost of preventing a case of blindness, the conclusion was that he could prevent 80,000 cases of blindness in his lifetime. One person, not particularly wealthy, could prevent 80,000 cases of blindness. You can think of this room, which holds 5,000 people. This room, 16 times over, all of those people who would have been blind, but for one person's contributions to reducing blindness. Toby thought that was an amazing fact, a fact that other people ought to know about. And that's why he pledged to live on something like, slightly more, but just a little more, than his graduate studentship, and to give the rest to the most effective charities he could find. And he founded this organization. Yes, he certainly deserves applause, but let's, let's hold it for the end. Um, he founded this organization, Giving What We Can, in order to let other people know of the opportunities that exist to do an immense amount of good in the world. 
Here's somebody else, not a philosopher, Julia Wise, simply growing up in Boston, felt that she was one of the fortunate people who had enough and knew, even as a teenager, that there were other people in the world much less fortunate than she was. So she decided to give away some of her, that stage of course, just pocket money, to help people who had less than she did. And when later she went to university, she met somebody, fell in love, and she persuaded her partner that when they had more, when they had graduated, they would do essentially what she was doing. So even when she they were together living quite modestly, again for a couple in Boston, on about $40,000 a year, they were giving away one-third of that. Now they're earning more and they're giving away half of what they earn. And if you want to learn how she does that and why she finds that a really fulfilling and rewarding way to live, have a look at the blog that you can see on your screen, givinggladly.com, where she writes in a very personal and accessible way about the life she is leading. I mention one more, an example, perhaps somebody culturally more akin to Mexico, uh, Chelso Vieira, who, who lives in Brazil, um, doesn't have very much money himself, um, but still, by living simply, is able to give 10% of his income to effective charities. And he founded the first Brazilian chapter of another organization, one that spun off, grew out of one of my books called The Life You Can Save. And he's founded a Brazilian chapter of that to encourage people to think more about effective altruism. So, those are some examples. I want also to mention a question that has been raised about if you do decide that you want to live as an effective altruist, then what is it that you should do with your life if you're at the stage of choosing a career? I know many of you have already made that choice, but some of you perhaps have not. So, here's a website that looks at that. It's called 80,000 hours for the number of hours that people are likely to work in their career. And there's some surprising answers that come out. One of those answers was followed by one of my students at Princeton, a young man called Matt Wager, who was a very good philosophy student and could probably, like Toby Ord, have gone to graduate school become a, eventually become a philosophy professor. But after talking with various effective altruists about how he could make the biggest difference in the world, he made a very different choice that some of you will find surprising. He decided to accept an offer from recruiters from Wall Street who come to Princeton to hire our bright graduates. And he went to work on Wall Street. Now, why did he do that? Here's the answer, not so that he could live luxuriously, but so that he would have more money to give away. The more you earn, the more you have to give away. And that's exactly what Matt has done. It's now four years that he's been working on Wall Street. In his first year already, he earned enough so that by living, again, relatively modestly, he could give away $100,000 to effective charities. And he's been giving away about half of his income ever since then. Now, some of you may say, but isn't he also doing harm by being part of Wall Street? Well, Matt would say, no, what his particular company does, working out, trying to, trying to, in a way, bet on which commodities are going to rise and fall in price. He doesn't think it actually makes much difference to the world, except for those for whom it earns profits. Um, doesn't think that it takes money away, it just smooths out the otherwise perhaps larger jumps in prices as they fluctuate. But in any case, if he had not taken this job, somebody else would have. And that other person would not have given away, most likely, a significant part of their income. So, 
the effect would have been the same as far as being a Wall Street trader is concerned, the effect would not have been the same as far as the charities are concerned. Okay, my timer seems to have stopped, so, you know, I may go on for quite a while now. It's not ticking down anymore. I want to say a little bit about how to choose which cause you give for. To, for. I've been talking about helping people in poverty, preventing them going blind. Um, is that the best chores, cause? It's certainly one cause. I want to suggest that some causes really are better than others. And I have this slide of Rockefeller Philanthropy Advisors in order to challenge the idea that they are suggesting and that many people in philanthropy believe that there is no objective answer to what is the best cause. So that's what they say on their website. What is the most urgent issue? There's obviously no objective answer to that question. I think that this is a mistake. And here's a couple of examples that also come from Rockefeller Philanthropy Advisors. So example one is a gift made by Ted Turner back in 1998, Ted Turner founded CNN, to give a billion dollars to scale up existing United Nations healthcare programs that prevent children dying from killer diseases that we already know how to prevent. These are not new diseases that we have no idea that we have to put a lot of money into research to try to prevent. These are things like measles, malaria, <clears throat> diarrhea. So the cost per life saved was very, very low. $80 perhaps was suggested. Probably it's gone up by now, but very low cost. A very good thing to do, I think. <coughs> Second example, also from Rockefeller Philanthropy Advisors, <coughs> is a gift made to establish a children's hospital in Palo Alto. Palo Alto, as many of you will know, is where Stanford University is, California, Silicon Valley. It's actually the third wealthiest community in the United States. So when you put money into a new children's hospital in Palo Alto, they don't save a child's life for $80, or for $800, or even for $8,000. They may save a child's life for a million dollars, or separate the lives, separate Siamese twins, conjoined twins, as is suggested here, for between one and two million dollars. Those are good things to do, but they're not the most effective thing to do. And so I think that there is an objective difference between what Ted Turner did and what Lucille Packard did. And I think what Ted Turner did was the better thing to do. <coughs> and I think actually both of those were better than what the entertainment mogul David Geffen did earlier this year. David Geffen is behind DreamWorks and other en entertainment ventures. He donated $100 million to the Lincoln Center in New York City in order to renovate what used to be Avery Fisher Concert Hall and is now going to become the David Geffen Concert Hall. <coughs> I don't think you can compare renovating a concert hall for wealthy New Yorkers and the tourists who go there with setting up a hospital, even in a relatively wealthy community, and far less can you compare it with reducing, children, reducing the deaths of small children. Okay, the timer has now come back on, and uh, that's not good news for me because I'm getting close to the end. But I do want to come back to this question of how do you know which charities are effective? And here's Holden Karnofsky again and his partner, uh, work partner, Ellie Hassenfeld, who, when working for a hedge fund, wanted to give away some of their earnings but couldn't find enough hard data, the kind of data that hedge fund analysts are used to working with, to which would be the best charity to give to. So in the end, they actually left their hedge fund, taking a big drop in income, of course, and set up an NGO called GiveWell. GiveWell.org, you can find the website. And they've reviewed hundreds of charities, and they've 
only recommended this thin orange slice you see on your screen. That's not because, that's not because the other charities are not good, they may be good, but it's because they do not have sufficient confidence in them being good, because they do not have enough scientific data to demonstrate what they're doing. So, the charities that GiveWell recommends, you can be highly confident that they've been very rigorously scrutinized and that you will get the best value for your donation. Some charities don't make it onto their screen, although I personally think that they're probably doing good work. For example, Oxfam, the international organization, doesn't make it because it's too big and too complicated an organization for GiveWell to assess. But it operates as an advocate for the poor very often. And that's what, one of these things that I was talking about before, where the expected value depends on the size of the payoff and the odds against success. Now Oxfam has many programs of advocacy that do not succeed, that do not pay off. But every now and again it gets a big win. And on this slide you can see one of its big wins. For an investment of only about $200,000, it helped civil societies in Ghana to persuade Parliament to allocate $116 million to some of the poorest sectors of the community, peasant farmers who need assistance to become more effective as farmers. So that's another example of the good things that you can do working for uh, working through effective charities. I'll leave you with this last slide. This is the organization I mentioned, The Life You Can Save, that spun off my book. It has more information for you on which charities are effective and it invites you to become an effective altruist, to contribute to some of these organizations, to join communities, perhaps to start chapters in your own communities and to think about how you can make the biggest possible difference for good in the universe. Thank you. Thank you.